first my title, you know, uh, let me just say I'm a co-director of what's called the Comprehensive Spine Center. And that sounds much more impressive than it is. It's basically we're building a spine center in a uh, community hospital in Philadelphia. I am uh, an employee of what's called the Redeemer Health System, which is a series of hospitals and life care facilities uh, just in Northeast Philadelphia. I trained at uh, Jefferson for medical school and for orthopedic residency, and I completed uh, Emory Fellowship last year. Um, my title is Finding the Hay in the Needle Stack. This is painful. I, I found the job process to be challenging, to be humbling, and to be riddled with COVID. And I think you guys are uh, in a similar boat, uh, no matter who, who's going through it. It's part of a new reality. I think hopefully this won't last for another year, calendar year, but it's something to think about. So I think it's a tough process. So uh, I'll just give you my thoughts on it as first. I think the per important thing is to understand your background. Who are you? What are you interested in? What makes you tick? So um, I met my wife in high school. That's Laura. This is Paw Patrol, uh, the pictures here. So for those of you with young children, uh, toddlers, it's a group of dogs, uh, puppies, I guess, that uh, provide municipal services to Adventure Bay, which is uh, the location. So I was Chase. My wife is Rubble. That's my son, Tommy, who's two and a half. And Margo there is three months old and miserable uh, with her sky choice. For me, it's about family. I grew up right outside of Philadelphia, and I have a background in academics. My father's a smart doctor, hematologist, oncologist, and my mom was a retired OR nurse at HUP. So I think it's important before you start any of this process, what makes me tick? What am I trying to do? And so again, my background, I, I really valued my time in Philadelphia. Um, these are my high school, that's my grade school to the left and then Jefferson. And then I went to Syracuse, Emory and uh, was at Jefferson for quite some time. This is the way I looked at the job process. It's a three-legged stool. There's three things that make up a job, particularly your first job, where are you working, how much they're gonna pay you to work and what kind of job you're gonna be in. And there's different flavors to all three of these processes. But I think if you wanna dumb it down like a football player like myself with some head injuries in the past, it's these three things. You're gonna be able to select one of the three unless you're really in a bad situation. I think anybody here in the process, you'll be able to pick one of the three. You will never, ever, ever, unless you're a uh, direct family member owns, uh, uh, last name was Dick Rothman or uh, has some other uh, familial tie, get all three of those. So you have to say, all right, what am I gonna give? What am I gonna take? There's a challenge to this though. It's not that simple uh, as finding that three-legged stool and picking one of the three. You gotta find that fit. So that's the second part. So the first part is who am I and what do I really care about? What can I not, uh, give up. And then you get into the details. So before you interview for a job, no matter what job it is, that's probably the best time to figure out what the heck this place is going on. So for me, uh, I'd never been to Redeemer Hospital. I'd, I've been in Northeast Philadelphia. I covered uh, a, a hospital that was about 10 minutes away from there, a big university hospital. So I went there the two or three days prior to the interview and I just walked around the hospital, just went in, walked around as a guest and just figured out things. And then I started asking questions and thinking about things. Who's been there in the past? How many cases are they doing there per year? This is somewhat more things that you'll figure out uh, during the interview process. But if you can find out some of this information early on, it makes a huge difference. And just seeing the size of the hospital, how many floors is it? How many beds is it? You can actually look up the beds and generally the size and actually the revenue of most hospitals online. The reps and vendors I found to be outstanding help. And the nice part about my choice of location being the most important thing was that I knew a lot of the local reps from uh, residency. And the other thing to consider is what else, what other surgeries are being done there? What's the ecosystem of this hospital? How is it going to work around? And again, like I said, you can, uh, look around, get an idea of the place. Where am I going to park every day? You know, things as simple as that. If you're not familiar with where you are, uh, that, could, that could be a pain in the butt. 
of course, the interview is very important. Um, this is the interaction you're going to have with the people. And I, you know, I think it's a game of, uh, you know, it's like a staring contest. It's both of you looking at each other and saying, well, how badly am I needed? And then you have to look and how badly does this person who's in fellowship and have uh, bags under their eyes, how much are they actually interested in coming here? So I think it's a back and forth. But then the big things are, uh, you know, there's a handful of things you got to pick up on. What's your call? Call is the by far, I find, the thing that's going to affect your family, your basic personal life. And those things are so invaluable, knowing how much free time am I realistically going to have during this first contract? Are there current partners that you're working with? Who's there that are that is doing the same types of surgeries as you? Are you going to be working with them directly? Do you have your own personal uh, support, uh, PA, MAs, who's going to be around with you? Are, am I having block time? Do I have a specific time during the week? Can it get bumped? When can I add on cases? How much wiggle room is there? When do I have to tell the OR staff that I have cases for the next week? And uh, those things are very important. And ultimately, this is so much different than residency and fellowship. This isn't a game of musical chairs and it's going to stop and you got to put your butt in one of the seats or else you're not going to move to the next step. You can walk away. There's nothing that says you have to have a job by April 1st or any random time. You can find your job whenever you can, the sooner the better from a credentialing standpoint, but you don't have to, there's no deadline to this process. I think the clinic for me is the part uh, as I'm getting the spine center off the ground uh, I've learned a lot. Um, where's your office? How many parking spots are there for your patients? How many rooms are you going to have when you're seeing patients? How many do you need? How busy is your schedule going to be as you start? It's not going to be that busy early on. You're just getting started. But as you're building up a practice, you have to understand how many people are going to be in at a given time. Uh, one of the most humbling things I learned when I first was starting at a medical office building at my facility is that the x-ray was not in the office. So you couldn't shoot x-rays there and it's down a floor. And I counted the steps, there's 190 steps to get there. When you have a patient with bad neurogenic claudication, they count every step themselves. So, you know, I'm setting up an x-ray suite right next to our area. It's things like that. And, you know, asking questions like, how long is it gonna take? How many texts are there to shoot for me? Those are the little things that add up each of those little, two or three minute increments over the course of a clinic day can really add up to an, an extra hour where you're just waiting. And then what's your, what's your support? And then the clinic template is something I learned about afterwards. You know, do you have two rooms? Do you want two rooms running at the same time? What are your blocks? Because when people are scheduling your clinic, they need to find a place to put your patients and they need to have a specific time frame. How long do you want your news to be? Are you gonna take 30 minutes, 40 minutes? follow-ups? Is it a surgical discussion? And you have to figure out how you're going to actually put the block schedule together to figure out your clinic. The OR obviously is very important, and I talked about a few of these things already, but how big is the OR? Is it going to fit everything you need? Are you using the OR? Are you using navigation? Do you need this? Are those things available to you? Who's, who are the vendors that they use? Are they in a cap disagreement, or do they follow a certain specific vendor for every orthopedic service line? Are you going to have difficulty getting whatever type of specific screw or, or rod or reduction system or whatever you want? Are they going to be there? Do you have the same team each week? Are you going to meet a whole new surgical tech and, and OR nurse every time you go in the room? Anesthesia, by far, you know, they're the, the gatekeepers of the operating room. What's their setup? How many are there? How many are there after 3 p.m.? Three o'clock is the most stress-inducing time for all of us. I think we have all experienced that process where it goes from six rooms running to two rooms running to I'm um, starting my hip fracture at 11 p.m. And those are the things you got to think about because those are the things that get you those early grades. And then when you're home, when you're home, are you truly home? Who's answering any of the patient calls? The patient calls, you don't even, I'm not very busy right now and I still get a ton of patient calls. And it can be as simple as, what was that dose of gabapentin you told me to take? When am I supposed to see you? Where am I getting this MRI? And you know, who's answering those calls after hours? More importantly for me is post-operative patients, who's triaging those calls? Is it something that can wait till the morning? Is it something that you have cross coverage with? 
Do you have partners to help you if you're unavailable? Who's rounding? Are you rounding? Do you round on your partner's patients? What's that environment like? And if there's something emergent going on, if your post-op patient suddenly has a foot drop, are they gonna tell you about it? Those are the things you gotta think about. After the interview, get someone to review any contract or employment agreement, period. Do not do that part by yourself. We've spent years training. We do have, we have no knowledge and I apologize for any MD, MBAs out there, but for the most part, we're not gonna understand exactly what it entails and the ramifications of your contract. And then ultimately don't sign anything and give yourself at least a week to talk to family, talk to friends, and figure out what's going on and understand the give and take, the push and pull, and figure out what you're willing to give up and what you're willing to continue with. I think one of the last things is understand that this is a negotiation. I think no matter what contract you receive and you love whatever it says in there, ask for something. See if they're going to play ball. The worst thing they're going to do is say no. Ask for another pen in clinic. Ask for something small and see what See where they go, see what you're willing to offer so that you have kind of an understanding of how much they want you and how important you are to the system. And so again, all of these things, these contract components, they should be stated and understood by you before you sign anything or you have someone, a professional explain it so that you can understand those things. I think probably of the most important bullet points here, understanding the terms of extermination and the length of your employment are gonna be critical and things that you don't want to discover on that agreement when they come up. So um, I think that's the most important thing and thing to understand. So I appreciate everybody's time. This is the group. I'm with this Comprehensive Spine Center with Neurosurgery Orthopedics, supported by a private group. So just getting things off the, off the ground, but uh, I have my personal email if anyone has any further questions outside of the uh, uh, conference this evening. Thank you for your time. That was great, Jim. Thank you so much. Um, so much of a different, you know, approach to things, but much to that contract discussion, because I think that a lot of us aren't really educated very well on how to approach that. Um, give us kind of an idea of, I know you said you talked to a professional as did I, but how many times did you send that contract back and what, what kind of conversation was that? Because to me that, you know, that's the most uncomfortable part. We're always amendable to anything that anyone's ever asked us to do in our entire training. And now you get to ask for something and, and how many times or kind of speak to that a little bit. Cause I thought it was really hard. I don't know if you do too. I, I couldn't agree with you more Kat. And again, I'm not, um, we're in the medical profession. We're passive aggressive at baseline, but the people that we're working up against the business people, they're just going to tell you flat out. They're, they're straightforward. And then they throw this legalese at you. It's just like when we're writing a, a research paper. It's, there's a complexity to all this. So for me, what happened was I went through all the parts of the contract. I didn't like my non-compete. It was 25 miles for three years. And it covered basically anywhere in Philadelphia if things didn't work out. So I sent it back for that. And then I asked about a different bonus structure and how I get compensated if I go over a certain collection. So uh, it was about three or four times. Now, I, I was blessed to have a cousin and one of my really good friends uh, of the family uh, both look over it who are specific contract lawyers. They actually, the one was not in medical law, but then the other one was in kind of medical contract. So I actually had two people uh, do it because again, I, I'm not the person that provides that. Find someone who can do that for you. Um, there's enough going on. You're doing enough in your fellowship year where you really don't want to be bogged down by that stuff, in my opinion. Hey, Jim, this is Rick Iyer. Did you, you, so you're employed by the hospital system, is that correct? That's right. Now, did you look at any pure private practices because they're slowly diminishing out there? That's, well, that's exactly right. Yeah, so, you know, the, it's funny because the, the group at the last slide is called Orthopedic Surgery and Rehab Associates. I initially was applying for that group in more of a private traditional setting. Um, the hospital purchased 80% of that practice. So, um, they ultimately kind of shifted me into a hospital paid position with private support. So 
I don't even know what you would call my job right now, other than, you know, just figuring things out on the fly and doing some spine surgery. But I'll tell you, I think that paradigm is shifting. I would totally agree with you, Rick. I, it's, it's one of these things where it's, um, you have to understand where this practice is going if you're looking in private for the next five, 10 years. Hey, Jim, good talk. Um, question, you, you laid out quite a few bullet points there of things to ask about uh, when you're sitting down with these people in the, the initial interview. Did you bring just a list of questions with you and fire back and forth? Or how did you go about getting those answers uh, from the people? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a great question. I, you know, for me, what happened was I had a pen and paper just with me. I, I met about a dozen people over the course of about a five to six hour interview day. And, you know, it varied from kind of the chief of surgery, the OR staff and things like that. So before I had the interview day, I basically sat down with a couple of my colleagues who had just gone through this. Uh, one of my buddies, Dave Casper, uh, down at UPenn. Um, and I just asked him, I was like, you know, what are some of the things you thought about? What are the things about things in retrospect you wish you had asked about and got kind of an understanding from that? So I think it's, again, just like Kat said, take advantage of the people, you know, the mentors, it's a small community and it's a very supportive one. So I think take advantage of any resources you have to understand what you're going through because they all have. <laughs> 